Welcome to The Artist Politic. Today we sit down with Ahama Luo at Fred Wildlife Refuge in Seattle. He is a musician, composer, comedian, and storyteller. We talk about his varied creative disciplines, whether or not we should be listening to Michael Jackson, and what it's like to be black in America and white in Nigeria. I feel like we should tell the viewers a little bit about Now I'm Fine um, because there's so much material there. It's, it's your life story. Yeah. So maybe you could give just like a, a quick overview of at least some of the stories that that show touches on so that people are kind of up to speed. Basically, the, the, the essence of the show it revolves around um, a very brief, probably six month period of time in my life. Uh, where everything that could possibly go wrong goes wrong. I was divorced, single parent, um, and then uh, my estranged father, who I had never met and only had one very uh, negative phone interaction with, mm -hmm. um, kind of unexpectedly passed away, and it's, it was this part of my life that was incomplete, and I always thought it would be complete at some point. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, it's, it's really partially about these kind of... Uh, just dramatic parts of life that so many people go through in so many different aspects and, and kind of the difficulty of those aspects of life combined with trying to keep things together on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm -hmm. And then another part of the show is about uh, the same period of time where I had a rare condition where my skin started dissolving. Uh, and so, I mean, it's very, very easy metaphors to be found within that about, <laughs> right. you know, keeping things together and falling apart and, and your, you know, mental health and your physical health and mm -hmm. um, what does it mean to be okay and what, you know. I want to remind you of a chat you and I had. Um, I don't know if you remember this. I most likely don't remember that's, it. That's fine. <laughs> you stopped by my studio. I can't remember what year this was. But Pioneer Square, right? Pioneer Square yeah. Studio. You stopped by for whatever reason. We kind of were catching up, and it, it was shortly after you had recovered from your your illness, from okay. your skin yeah. skin issue, we'll call it. Yeah. Um, and you were just sort of like telling me the tale, you know. Yeah. And I feel like at that moment, you had yet to find the humor in that story, or at least in your telling yeah. of it to me. And I wonder about, because in, in your stage show, there's, there's kind of a stand-up comedy yeah. element to it, um, as well as a more serious stage show, but you know those kind of meet somewhere yeah, in the middle. Totally. Um, and I wonder about when you found the humor in that story, because it's a, it's a dark story when told straight up, factually. Yeah, I mean, where did you... I mean, maybe I just wasn't very funny that day, but I, for, <laughs> but I, I really... I mean, part of the why that show existed is because, um, you know, in my in my physical condition, and I had a complete inability to do, you know, any of any of the different disciplines that I'm involved in. My mm -hmm. background being, you know, music and stand up being the two the two kind of like specific places where I'm rooted in, uh, and I couldn't pr perform music because of my physical state. And then I also I looked really terrifying and uh it just didn't seem like doing stand-up was really an option mm -hmm. um and i just got fl like my the uh, the idea that i couldn't do those things i just got flooded mm -hmm. just like every single aspect of the situation became a joke to me you know every time I sat there closing my eyes, thinking about how I couldn't do those things. Like melodies were just like coming in. And, and it was really like during that time where I couldn't do anything, where I just had this kind of creative thing and, and jokes were always, jokes were always a part of it. You know, I, uh, and, and definitely as soon as I 
was visibly well enough to go and, and do stand up again. Um, I started doing that, and that's what all the material was about. It was all mm-hmm. about those things, and it was all about, uh, and it, in like the ideal situation, it, it would be like it was all about those things, and then like people were shocked and they loved it, and it was wonderful. But really, it was like, oh, this is not necessarily appropriate for a stand up mm. for a stand up environment. Uh, this is. Like sometimes it goes okay, but most of the time I'm like looking over at, you know, I'm, I'm at a comedy club talking about a skin dissolving disease. And then there's like, you know, a, a bachelorette party with like a, you know, a sash and <laughs> like, right, you know, a tiara with a penis dick on straws. It. Yeah, right. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, right. not, not that in any way. Women are the biggest problem at comedy clubs because it's definitely men are definitely the biggest problem at comedy mm-hmm. clubs. But just as an example, uh, at, you know, and I'm it's Saturday night and people are trying to have a good time, mm-hmm. and uh, no matter, you know, there is probably someone that's good enough at stand up comedy that would be able to make that type of material work in that specific environment. Mm-hmm. But I am definitely not that person, and it and it and it was kind of the fact that. I liked that material more than I liked doing stand-up mm. that kind of pushed me to like move a little out of that medium into kind of a more uh, narrative stand-up, um, like narrative storytelling yeah. thing that kind of became the, the basis for the show. Okay, so it was, so it was a conscious thing, like you, you were kind of chipping away at the stand-up thing still, yeah. and then you, had, you just saw an opportunity to like use that material in a different yeah. more effective way yeah. in the, the stage and show. And the great thing is, you know, the thing that I absolutely love about stand-up comedy is it's like it has this kind of, you know, built-in litmus test to it, like as to the, the you know, comedy has, has a receipt, you know, mm-hmm. as to whether or not it worked. And not to say that everything that makes someone laughs is good or worth saying or anything like that, but... <clears throat> uh, you're getting immediate feedback. Yeah, it, you know, it's not 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 everything that makes people laugh is good comedy, but all good comedy makes people laugh. Mm-hmm. There are people that would disagree with me, but I I, <laughs> I hold strong to that. Seems, and, seems uh, fair. Yeah, but you know, and and that can be in a million different ways. That can be you know, like my favorite comic Stuart Lee sometimes has these long arcs that lack laughter with the idea of suspending laughter for a specific release in a time, but mm-hmm. laughter is involved and it is, uh, and it's, you know, one of the only things that if you, if you fail at it, not only did you fail at it, you're not even doing it. Like if you go and do stand-up comedy and you don't make anyone laugh through your entire set, you didn't just do bad comedy. You did not do comedy. You did some, you just talked to people. Like you <laughs> yeah. just did a completely yeah. different thing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, and it's, so to to move to a storytelling realm, but to kind of keep that same litmus test that like this like has to make people laugh and it has to be genuinely funny in the way that stand up is funny and and like hard jokes and really mm-hmm. um, and uh, and I think that's really served me well in that in, in that storytelling environment. Can we talk about your father a little bit? Yeah, for sure. Let's talk first about. Um the one phone call you had with your father yeah. when you were you were a teenager yeah and well you can you can tell it a little a little bit but it was not positive no and no. uh he he was discouraging of your interest in music yeah as a career um maybe you can talk a little bit about that but i'm i'm wondering did did that push you further into wanting to be a creator and an artist, or at least at the time, a trumpet player? Honestly, I've never, I've never imagined myself doing anything other than creative stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, I just, you know, it's been my refuge since as long as my memory goes back. I, you know, had a very, you know, I grew up really, really poor. Like, mm-hmm. you know, my sister and I, you know, my, my little sister to an extent, but she's a lot younger and had a, a much more stable life, but my older sister, Ijoma, and I, you know, for America, experienced a very, very, you know, 
harsh rung of poverty, mm -hmm. you know, growing up on welfare, always, always, you know, Section 8 housing, mm -hmm. uh, living in less than ideal areas. Like, I, under I understand now, <laughs> like, a as an adult, um, thinking about my father and his life, and I think about how, even, even with my own struggles and troubles and whatever my childhood was growing up, I mean, it, it's just doesn't, it doesn't compare. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can imagine the, I, I mean, I can imagine the idea of a professional musician to my, my dad and his life and his life experience being just like the most frivolous mm. thing, you know? Um, hmm. That's and, interesting that you've, that you've come around because when you tell the story of that phone call, it, of course, at that moment, being mm -hmm. a 16-year-old, it seemed to crush you and really oh, affect, you know. Oh, it absolutely did, yeah. And, and to have that be the one conversation yeah. with your father, I mean, I can't imagine the, you know, just the emotional weight of all that and trying to find your way as a teenager and, you know, the whole story has got to be really tough. And so it's really interesting to hear that now as an adult, you have more understanding for his perspective on that. Yeah, it's still not the way I would have done things. I mean, sure. it's still, I mean, it's still a real bad way to handle that situation. And I, and I think that, you know, um, it's, but it, I, my, my, I know my, I, I, now I know a lot of my siblings from, and, and a lot of my siblings, you know, it's, it's really difficult for me uh, to say whether my father being in their life to the extent that he was had a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Whether that, you know, and so this thing that like kind of this abandonment that defines your life, you know, also to, to think back now and like, would that, like, would I be a worse person? It's very possible, you know, it's very, po like, there's something about like just straight abandonment that at least it's like, it, it creates a lot of problems. It creates a lot of, you know, kind of deficiencies in your brain that you never really figure out how to get over. Mm -hmm. You know, you never, it, it changes, it changes you that kind of like flat, you know, I, I don't, I don't know my dad. I don't, I don't, I don't know what he was like. I, I don't, uh, and, and it's not because he, you know, died fighting fire. It's not, mm -hmm. you know, it's not because mm -hmm. it's because he went away and then didn't make the effort to, um, it would have been a, a big effort, but you know, he didn't make any effort mm -hmm. really to maintain any contact. And, uh, and that, and that type of thing, you know, it's, it really, it really impacts you. The, his, dis, his disappearance is symptomatic of something else. It's symptomatic of something else inside of him. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a disconnect between him and other people like to to do that to to your children you know i have i have two children of my own and it's you know it and that disconnect it, it exists whether you are on the other side of an ocean between your children or whether you live in the same village as your children mm -hmm. and to grow up with that disconnect on a daily basis and to be reminded of that over and over again you know uh Coming to the realization that, I, like, I obviously this was a bad situation, but it might have been the best. It might have been the best situation. You know, it might have been like I. I think about who who my mom is, and I think about the type of person that she is, and 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 the, and and being a a very one of those rare. Um, Per, a person who's accepting of all people. I mean, and she just really is, and she has been my whole life. Uh, so it's really, you know, I, I really do kind of, especially at this point in my life, land firmly on the, you know, this was a, a good way for things to work out, mm -hmm. which is just kind of inconceivable to my childhood self that this is like, you know, you, you're, you're probably, you're maybe better off. Like, right. uh, hmm. Are you ready for the lightning round? Mm-hmm. Okay. So, I never actually get struck by lightning right now. I don't think so. We'll, we'll see how it goes. You blew all your budget. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, what's your favorite local venue to play? Music or 
Can I can I give a, a, a sure. music and and comedy answer? Yeah. I you know I've always I've always been a big fan of of lo-fi. I haven't performed there in a long time, mm-hmm. but it's just like it's just a. I remember performing at that space before it was even like a legitimate space, and yeah. before they even like they had that upstairs loft that didn't even have a guardrail on it. Yeah, it right. was like, I remember those days. Uh, yeah. And you know, I mean, as our city changes, sorry, this is, I'll make it. <laughs> as our city changes, like I just can't imagine a new lo-fi. I can't imagine mm-hmm. someone being able to open up a place like that and open up like a, a you know this DIY venue that's open to so many aspects of it. So, I mean, music, I love that. Comedy, I don't really do a ton of stand-up comedy, but I really like uh, the Clock Out Lounge on Beacon Hill. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they have a, a comedy show on Wednesdays that I sometimes pop into and, and do a set. Oh, that's um, great. I need to go check that out. What is the best sitcom ever made? Uh, best sitcom ever made. I'll say my, my absolute favorite sitcoms, uh, 30 Rock is just one of the funniest mm. shows ever. Uh, I'm Alan Partridge which for some reason has never really gotten popular. It's the second season of I'm Alan Partridge is just like one of the greatest seasons of TV. And then, I mean, if you're talking about, I don't know if you really, I know it's sl- slightly different because it's like the comedy mob, but both British and American offices are just, during, you know, the American during its prime is, is really masterful, mm-hmm. you know, comedy writing. And yeah. I mean, comedy writing's my thing, I love it. Yeah, comedy writing's my awesome man. Thing. Uh, what's the last thing you got obsessive about that is not artwork related? Not artwork related. That's not artwork related. I mean, <laughs> if I'm honest, if I'm please, honest, please be. If I'm honest, I I look at World Star every day, <laughs> uh, and. I call it the news. <laughs> I'm looking at the news, <laughs> see what's up with the news. Uh, That's great, man. It's a little less uh, upsetting than the real news. Uh, upsetting in a little ways. less, a little less crazy than the real, <laughs> a little calmer <laughs> yeah, than right. the real news. Uh, it is, you know. Sometimes, weirdly, you find out about the real news earlier on World Star than you do on the real news. But I definitely, you know. I th- I think that I find myself in like I'm I'm not like rich by any means or anything like that but you know when you when you're like an art person you're like you're always at like a fancy dinner thing mm-hmm. you're always like live you're and and especially like in co- like in comedy writing when I, in the times that I've been involved in like especially like television comedy writing I mean I go into a, a TV writers room and like I'm a poor person who's never graduated from anything from high school or college or mm-hmm. anything in my life, and you know, all of those it's all rich people that went to Harvard. It's like, mm-hmm. and that's just like, and that's just the path they took to get into that. Uh, and I think that like, <laughs> I'm just constantly surrounded by rich people that were given a lot of opportunity, and 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 I think when you like when your career moves forward and you and you get like that's kind of what happens is you're around really privileged people all the time i'm not even saying that as a negative thing i guess that's just like uh so, i mean so there's something about like i feel like world star is like <laughs> that's like that's like the apartment complex that i grew up in like oh, that's yeah. like that's that's you know where a f- even though obviously i disagree with so many of what so much of what it puts out into the world and like and I don't think that it's necessarily like a positive thing but for me it's like this is like this is my people this is where I come from (laughs) like and I don't even mean in terms of race I mean and like in terms of class like I don't come from I don't come from middle class I don't like and I spend all my time in middle class or above and I I feel like I just need that kind of daily connection to that was real slow lightning I love it man (laughs) I love it it doesn't matter pick one comedy or music I have music I'm better at it okay one more lightning round then we'll get on with it but I really want to know the answer to this one (laughs) off the wall thriller or bad um I 
mean, I gotta say, as an album, 